Hi there, uh, Alan Shields here, the COO of RFI Group. Uh, it's always a pleasure to speak at our New Zealand conferences. I believe this is the fifth year in a row that we've been running uh, the New Zealand Banking Innovation Summit or uh, its previous incarnation, the New Zealand Digital Banking Conference. Um, one of our favourite uh, conferences for me. There's lo always lots of insights to share, um, always lots of innovation that's going on in, uh, in the Kiwi market that's uh, you know, worth talking about and, and then worth sharing uh, around the globe as we talk to banks. The thing that I'm going to be talking about today is uh, where innovation meets trust as we recover from the pandemic. And, you know, throughout the, the agenda, there's lots of uh, different topics that we're going to be covering off around, you know, pure innovation, around the role of open banking um, and, you know, uh, innovation in lending in, in rural areas. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to take a step back from that and talk more um, generically, I guess, about the need for uh, a different type of approach to the way that we service customers uh, in a post pandemic world. I'm going to largely dwell on three areas. One of those is the changing needs of customers. So, you know, what's happening um, with regard to confidence? What does that mean in, from a behavioural perspective? And what are we seeing shift? I'm going to look at the, the relationships that organisations in New Zealand have with customers um, and where trust fits into that. And also, you know, try and understand from the customer perspective, what it is that uh, they're looking for from their financial services providers. Uh, and then I'm gonna finish off with uh, some exploration of different ways to deliver that, um, to, to, to answer those needs uh, and to deliver that in a, in a way that's uh, exceptional from a servicing perspective. Um, and hopefully you'll find it uh, insightful. Now, just a couple of um, points before I, I do sort of kick into this. Um, I'm a big uh, nerd. I really love uh, data. I really love uh, seeing charts. So, you know, you're going to see lots and lots of um, statistics and lots and lots of data. And my job as we go through that is to tell you a story um, that brings it all together. Uh, but I do have a very low excitement threshold. So um, just be aware of that as we go through. Um, let's start off with the meeting um, of the different needs of consumers in today's world. Uh, I think it's you know, uh, probably a massive understatement to say that we live in a very different uh, economy and environment in uh, June 2021 than we did um, in June 2020 or uh, you know, uh, March 2020. We've come through an awful lot um, in the last 15 months. Uh, and that's probably then no surprise that we've seen consumers reacting to that uh, and behaving uh, in slightly different ways. One of the, one of the best kind of um, indicators that I like to look at whenever I think about how consumers are changing is uh, the sort of measure of their confidence. Uh, and what you can see here is the Westpac McDermott Miller New Zealand Con Consumer Confidence Index, um, the blue line on the left hand chart. Um, which basically charts out how consumer confidence has changed uh, over the last um, 12 years or so. Uh, and effectively what it shows is that, you know, as we, as we went into 2020, um, confidence was uh, not uh, a, a historic high or anything, but it was um, relatively good coming into the, the, the pandemic. Um, and what we saw as we went into the pandemic was it was a very, very significant drop uh, in consumer sentiment in a very short period of time. Um, and then as we sort of moved towards the end of 2020, uh, New Zealand did pretty well um, from a pandemic perspective uh, and consumer confidence started to recover. So we're, we're in sort of this situation in 2021 where consumer confidence is um, okay um, on average um, and uh, is better than it was uh, a year ago. Um, and it, but it's certainly sort of, you know, in, we're in a period of flux, I believe, at the moment. Um, if we look at the uh, a sort of um, alternative view of uh, how consumers are doing, uh, unemployment on the right hand side here, you can see that basically um, the unemployment rate um, is higher than it was um, a year ago. 
Um, but it's returning, I think it's fair to say it's returning to what we might have regarded as pre-pandemic levels. So we're in this situation where confidence on average um, is okay, um, but the unemployment rate is probably higher than when, where we would like it to be. Um, and I think both of those lines that you can see on there um, have gone up and down um, over a relatively short period of time. And that sort of uh, uncertainty, those kind of changes are never very good for consumers. Um, uncertainty is, is a bit of a killer um, from a consumer perspective. Um, and so when we talk to consumers about whether they've been impacted by the pandemic and whether their income specifically has changed, uh, what we see is that there are definitely pockets of the population who really have suffered. Um, so, you know, the average confidence is okay, but averages hide all manner of sins. My uh, head is in the oven and my feet are in the freezer, but on average, I'm the right temperature um, is, is probably something that we could apply. When we look at how consumers have been Im impacted from an income perspective, and we break it down by the type of work that they do, you can see on here that anybody who is self-employed, so think small business owners, anybody who's in part-time employment or seasonal employment, anybody who's uh, you know, in student, um, uh, sorry, anybody who's a student, they're all suffering more so than your average fully employed uh, consumer within the population. And of course, what that means is that that pain of um, decreased income is felt um, by those pockets and those pockets of uh, employment tend to be skewed much more towards um, younger consumers. Um, so there's a bit of a story that there starts to emerge around the youth segment. And that's kind of reinforced when you start to look at, you know, the, the, the actions that occur because of um, reductions in income. So what we might expect to see is that people start to spend or borrow or save differently. Um, and you can see that come through when we talk to uh, savers within the New Zealand market and we ask them whether they've had to dip into their savings to fund their start lifestyle in the previous three months. And on here, you can see the percentage um, that said that they had done so um, in, our, in our last um, savings survey towards the end of 2020. Uh, and you can see here that basically 49% of all savers had had to dip into their savings to fund their lifestyle. That was up from 42% in May. So we could surmise from that that we're into getting into a situation where an increasingly large proportion of savers is needing to dip into their savings in order to um, just survive really. Uh, and a lot of that money goes towards unexpected expenses, general household expenses, not the type of stuff that savers really want to be spending their money on. Um, and it's also fair to say when you look at the chart on here that the impact or the need to use that savings is much greater amongst younger consumers. So if they're under the age of 35, more than half um, are, have been dipping into their savings in a three month period to fund lifestyle. And if they're under 25, it's almost two in three in the latest data. So impacts obviously being felt uh, across the nation. Um, as a result of that, when we talk to consumers and we ask them uh, to tell us as a result of the pandemic, have their attitudes or behaviours towards certain areas of financial services changed? And the things that we see uh, most commonly uh, when we look at this, this type of a response are that, you know, um, we've got more than 60% um, of consumers saying that they're increasingly looking for ways to save money. So, you know, a larger and larger proportion of savers being forced to use the money in their savings. Uh, an increasingly large proportion of people generally thinking about how they save. We've got a similar proportion of consumers saying that they are paying more attention to the prices that they're, they're paying when they make purchases. Um, and uh, a similar proportion saying that they're trying to shop locally in order to support smaller um, local businesses um, within the New Zealand economy. So we, we're seeing effectively then the um, results of the pandemic uh, impact on consumer attitudes um, and behaviours um, within the economy. Uh, and that sort of can be shown quite neatly with this slide here, which basically just looks at um, a nationally representative group of uh, New Zealand consumers over a, um, a year, one year period here. 
and we've got the proportion of consumers um, in the three charts here that say they will do more or less of spending, borrowing and saving. Uh, and effectively, um, there's a couple of things that sort of jump out here. One is that the proportion of consumers saying they were going to try and spend less um, had uh, increased between December 19 and November 2020 by almost 20, 20%. So it went up from 26% to 45%. At the same time, the proportion of consumers that say they're going to save more increased from 41% to 59%. So, you know, the, the overwhelming sentiment amongst the New Zealand population is that they want to put some money aside um, because, you know, they don't know really when they're going to need it and they want a buffer. And that's, that is uncertainty in action that we're seeing come through there. Um, the other kind of um, interesting trend that we're seeing uh, from a spending perspective is buy now, pay later. Now, I think you probably have to uh, have lived under a rock uh, in order to be unaware of buy now, pay later at the moment, um, particularly in Australia and New Zealand, where, where the category is, um, has, has, is, is a lot more mature than it is in, in some of the other markets that we deal with. Um, but you can see on here basically that almost 40% now of um, consumers, sorry, uh, almost uh, one in three uh, consumers uh, in the New Zealand population has used a buy now, pay later service of some kind. Um, and the usage of buy now, pay later skews much more towards younger consumers. So if they're under um, 35 years of age, almost one in two uh, consumers has used buy now, pay later. So, um, you know, we've, there's, there's this, this theme of younger consumers being impacted more from a decrease in um, income perspective coming through. You've got, uh, younger consumers significantly more likely to have needed to dip into their savings to fund their lifestyle um, and uh, younger consumers significantly more likely to have um, used buy now pay later. Um, and buy now pay later is obviously, you know, it's now a significant enough payment mechanism within the local market that it's beginning to have an impact on more traditional payment methods. This slide here is, is quite an interesting one. Basically, what it shows is that if we look at buy now, pay later users who have a credit card, um, the blue line, versus um, non buy now, pay later users with a credit card, you can see that the proportion of those consumers that use their credit card in a typical month um, has changed quite significantly over a, a sort of three year period. So we go back to April 2017. If you're a buy now, pay later user, um, who use the, um, sorry, of the buy now, pay later users, 58% were using a credit card um, in a typical month, roll forward to November 2020, and that proportion had fallen to 37%. At the same time, um, you know, we're not seeing a necessarily a, a huge decline amongst the non buy now, pay later users who use a credit card in a typical month. So it's not that there's necessarily this sort of um, overwhelming decline in credit card usage amongst. The, the whole population, it's definitely um, more prevalent in certain pockets. Uh, and I think what's interesting here is, A, we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that buy now, pay later users are not credit card holders. Um, but B, um, we're actually seeing action there around how a new category is impacting on a more traditional um, payment category. Now, why do I talk about buy now, pay later? Why is that interesting in the context of what we've been talking about with regard to consumer uncertainty and behavior? Um, well, effectively, the reasons that consumers use buy now, pay later uh, fits in with this overwhelming sentiment of consumers in the market and their, their sort of desire to do things in a smart way. Um, so when we ask buy now, pay later users why they choose to use buy now, pay later, um, you can see here, number one response, 57% of those buy now, pay later users um, means that, you know, not having to pay for the purchase up front um, meant that they can make better use of their money. So they're using their money in a smarter way. Um, then you've got, you know, sentiment around um, it's a way of avoiding interest. You've got 45% of consumers saying it helps me budget. Um, you know, that, that, that kind of those three things fit very much into the psyche of a group of consumers who uh, is worried about their personal economy, um, is worried about what their savings are gonna be able to do for them in the future, and is looking for 
smarter ways to spend and to save and to borrow. Um, and that kind of that factor, I think, for buy now pay later means that it's the, the right um, payment mechanism at the right time from a consumer sentiment perspective. I also think, and I should say before I go off this slide, one of my one of the um, the statistics that keeps jumping out to me, it doesn't matter what market we look at buy now pay later in uh, around the world, there's a decent chunk of consumers who are using buy now pay later just to give it a try. They've seen the brand, it's there at point of sale or it's there when they check out online and they just want to give it a go. Um, and, you know, if you can sit there and say that, well, one in five of my customers um, is, 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 is using my brand just to give it, just to sort of see what it's like, um, that's phenomenally powerful um, from a growth perspective. Um, so um, I've no doubt that Buy Now Pay Later um, is, is here for some time um, and, you know, there's, there's uh, a lot of sentiment to be tapped into there from a consumer perspective. Um, so where does that leave us from a customer relationship perspective? We understand that consumers are changing the way that they think, the way that they feel, the way that they behave. Um, what does that mean from a, from a traditional financial services perspective? Um, well, I think, to be honest, when I, when I think about relationships within banking, trust is the, the, the thing that is at the forefront of those relationships. Um, and we've done a, we've just done a, a brand new survey um, in the New Zealand market where we've looked at the trust of different providers uh, in, in, with regard to um, maintaining privacy and security of personal information. Now that's obviously very relevant because we're talking about open banking in New Zealand. Um, and what does open banking do? Well, it basically um, enables consumers to consent to sharing their banking data with um, non-banking uh, partners. Uh, and so trust is really important. Um, and what we see at the moment is that the traditional banking model is, is in a phenomenal position when it comes to trust. So 58% um, of consumers have uh, a complete level of trust. So they, they'd score their trust levels an eight, nine or a 10 um, in banks um, holding and, and maintaining the privacy and security of their personal information. Um, card schemes, your visas, your mastercards um, have a, a, a sort of secondary and second place position in there. Then comes your government agencies then telecommunications providers then tech companies um, and then a new digital only um, or fintech um, provider. So uh, if on the face value, the, the banks have a very um, uh, privileged position um, in the market and that, and that trust um, uh, you know, obviously is well earned, um, but it also reaps dividends. So if I look at the impact of trust on metrics like uh, loyalty and like NPS, um, there is absolutely a definite correlation between those, those two factors. So on the left-hand side, if I ask consumers um, to what extent they trust their main financial institution, you can see on here, as we just saw in the previous slide, um, a large proportion of, of New Zealand consumers trust their a bank to maintain their, their privacy. Um, and so therefore it goes to, um, stands to reason that the average New Zealand consumer trusts their MFI. Uh, and in fact, 74% um, have complete trust uh, in their MFI. Um, but what do we care? Does it make a difference? Um, um, if you look at the right-hand side chart here, we're looking at two uh, groups of consumers, those that have low trust, in their main financial institution on the left-hand side and those that have a high level of trust. Uh, and if we look at NPS, a measure which I'm sure is in a lot of your, your uh, executive scorecards, um, a consumer that has low trust in their MFI, um, that as a group, those, the, those consumers um, have an NPS with their MFI of minus 78. Um, if they have a high level of trust, those consumers as a group have an NPS with their MFI of plus 21. And, you know, if you know how NPS is calculated, which I'm sure you will do, that's night and day. Um, but it also matters when it comes to future consideration. So we've, we've called it loyalty on here. It, effectively, it's the proportion of consumers who would consider their current um, transactional account provider for future savings needs. Uh, and you've got on here, you know, if they have low trust in, their, in that MFI, that transaction account provider, 
59% would consider them for their future savings needs. If they have a high level of trust, uh, 86% would consider them. So trust matters. Trust is at the heart of the relationship and trust is at the heart of whatever comes next from an ongoing relationship perspective. Um, what does an organization need to do then um, to uh, maintain your trust? Uh, of, uh, a question that we put to, to New Zealand consumers. Uh, and there are kind of, there, there are three things that really stand out the most. One of those is keep my money safe. Um, and obviously that, that's a big factor, right? So I care about my money, keep it safe. The other thing I care about is my information. So keep that safe. Um, and 65% and 63% of consumers choose those two factors in their top three factors when it comes to uh, you know, maintaining trust um, with a financial institution. The third thing on there is around fees and charges. So transparency. So you know, be clear and open with me around what it is that you're going to be charging me for different things. We've just seen why people are drawn to buy now, pay later. You know, the, the sort of no fee model um, is, is, a, is a big factor for consumers. Um, we also saw that they did it to avoid interest. So, you know, being open and upfront with consumers is, is, is going to be the best policy when it comes to um, being trustworthy. The last thing consumers want is hidden fees that kind of come and bite them um, down the track that they, that they perhaps, you know, weren't aware of um, upfront. Um, but the other thing that's really interesting on here is, um, you know, the, as you look down the list is um, being available for consumers. So if I need you, be available. Um, that, that's really important from a trust perspective. Um, tell me if there's a better product for my needs or my situation. Um, and again, you know, if you think about the situation we're in and where consumers' uh, sentiment is at with regard to the economy, uh, their personal economies, um, and the impact that's having on their change in behaviour, um, there's, there's a very big role for banks to play here in you know, making sure customers are smart about their banking and smart about their financial services and making sure that they actually feel um, like you as an organisation are helping them to do it. Because when we look at um, whether consumers have a good understanding of banking and finance generally, we actually find there's that a large proportion of consumers um, are, uh, you know, fully prepared to admit that they do not have a high level of understanding of banking and finance. So on this chart, the light blue uh, segment at the top of the columns is the proportion of consumers that have a high level of understanding of banking and finance. Um, and you can see there 49% of Kiwis on the far right hand side um, believe that they've got a high level of understanding of banking and finance. But of course, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a great believer in there being two sides to every statistic. And so what I see when I look at that is that more than one in two don't have a high level of understanding. And actually for younger consumers, um, that proportion that has a, 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 a specifically a low level of understanding is almost one in five. So is there something we can be doing more to help our customers when it comes to banking and finance? That's a great sort of um, question to start off with. Uh, and when we look at whether um, consumers are happy with their um, transactional account providers, so there's, which tends to be obviously their, their sort of main financial institution or their main banking organization. There are a number of pain points that we see and that we've identified in the relationship at this point in time. Um, and those three things are there in orange. These are things that are relatively highly correlated to overall satisfaction with a primary tra transaction account provider, but that are relatively low in satisfaction. And they are, alerts or tools that help me manage my money, the level of support that I'm being offered through the COVID pandemic, and the tools and the information that's provided me to help me improve my financial well-being. So, you know, if that's not um, customers letting us know that there's more that we can be doing to help them, um, in particularly in, a, in an environment where they're not feeling um, particularly certain about their their, their financial situation, then I, then I don't know what it is. Um, and, you know, I think that that's kind of a good segue into the last section of this, which is around how do we meet those needs and what's on the horizon that's going to enable us to do that or enable other organisations to come in and do it for us. Um, I'll start off with this 
slide, which I found fascinating. I wasn't um, aware of this, but this is a, a date, piece of data that we've been tracking for um, a, couple, a couple of years now, which is around the awareness and usage of budgeting and PFM style apps and tools. Um, these are obviously, you know, relating back to that previous slide, some of the areas where they, their customers are expressing pain points um, that, that, we can, that we can help with. And the thing that jumped out at me was, was this. If you look at the orange line on here, this is a proportion of Kiwis that are using PFM apps and tools. That number's not, that proportion's hardly grown. We're in an environment now where consumers, you know, clearly are changing the way they're behaving. They clearly uh, want help, uh, and yet they're not taking it through these PFM apps. So there must be more. Um, there must be, you know, there must be um, opportunity for an organisation that has an existing relationship with these consumers to start to offer the value. And when you ask consumers what it is that they want, what are the types of advice or insights that they would find valuable? Um, there's a couple of things that, that really sort of jump out at me when I, when I look at this data. One of those is that, you know, overall, the average consumer wants um, to be notified about benefits to them. So if there, is there a rebate on this? Is there a concession on this that I might be eligible for? 55% of consumers in, in New Zealand want that. Um, but you'll notice that that's skewed towards an older generation. And what I've been talking about through this presentation is, is quite clearly that younger consumers are the ones who are feeling the most pain, who have the most uncertainty around finances, and who are the ones who are needing to dip into their savings to a greater extent. Uh, and what they want is personalised spending and savings insights. They want savings calculators. They want advice on how they stick to a budget and how they set a budget. They want to be able to see how they're going towards certain goals that they've got. So, that, so, so there's three ways that you can help to um, address some of the pain points that younger consumers might, might be facing. Another question that we asked consumers was around, um, you know, if we were to put an app in front of them that helped them manage their personal finances specifically, what would be the top things that they would be looking for? They got to pick three. Um, and there's, interestingly, there's three kind of clear, clear winners. So I want to, again, I want to be able to um, uh, set up budget um, for, you know, specific spend categories and want to be able to track against those things. I want to be able to use my banking history um, and, and be notified of where I could be cutting back on my spending. Think um, smart spending um, from a customer perspective. Um, and I want to be able to track my spending patterns uh, over a specific period. So, so again, there's, there's kind of clear ways as um, uh, organisations with relationships with these um, people that we can help um, to alleviate some of their pains, make them feel smarter about their finances and really kind of tap into the, to, to how they're feeling. Um, I've mentioned Buy Now Pay Later a couple of times through this presentation. And one of the um, things that strikes me when I look at the Buy Now Pay Later um, experience is, is the, the, the CX itself. Um, and so this chart here just shows you for a, a few of the different um, Buy Now Pay Later brands in existence in the New Zealand market, how satisfied are customers on the left with those um, services when they've used them. And on the right-hand side, how likely are they to recommend them? Um, and you can see on here that they're, they're pretty enviable stats, right? So the, you know, we take Afterpay on the far left, 80% um, of customers that use Afterpay were extremely satisfied and another 13% satisfied. So 93% satisfaction, if you like. Um, and and it, doesn't, it doesn't really change much across any of those brands. And, and so as a consequence, Consumers that are using these brands are happy. Uh, on the right-hand side, they are advocating for those brands. Um, the group of consumers that's most um, likely to be using Buy Now Pay Later is younger consumers. Um, and so, they, so their trust in those providers is going to be building um, over time. And those, you know, those Buy Now Pay Later providers have got a nice runway in front of them um, where there's kind of logical steps in the buy now pay later journey, right? What are, what are the things that they could be offering um, to consumers in the market that might encourage them to use buy now pay later more? Well, they could be offering rewards. They could be offering them um, the ability to make early repayments on their repurchases. They could be enable, giving them a tracker to show how they're doing against um, different purchase amounts that they have outstanding. 
effectively, there are ways that buy now, pay later providers could be further in um, ingratiating themselves with consumers around the sentiment that they feel around, you know, cutting back on spending, budgeting more sensibly, using my money in a smarter and smarter way. Um, you know, and if you think about that, um, you know, that position that by now later is, is earning itself in the market and you think about what's coming down the track with open banking. Um, I won't bore you too much with the text on here. You can read it on the, on the slide deck afterwards. But, you know, when we talk to consumers about um, the legislation, um, what it's going to mean in terms of sharing data and what some of the benefits will be around consolidated views of banking, faster applications, reliable, tailored advice, um, deals on different banking products and, thing, and recommendations for more suitable products. Those things all tap into what I've been talking about. Um, and, you know, the, the consumer reaction to that, when we say to them, you know, based on that description, how would you feel about consenting to sharing your personal data with providers in order to access those benefits? Um, sure, I'm not going to sit here and say 90% of consumers say they'd be you know, wildly enthusiastic about sharing their data. But what I can tell you is that nearly 20% are interested right off the bat. Um, about half of the population is not sure, but you know, wants to understand more about the benefits. Um, you know, and that's a significant chunk of, of people. And the other thing, and this kind of fits with the theme that's been running through this, is that the group of consumers that's most open to sharing their data in an open banking environment will be the younger consumers. If they're under 45, the proportion of consumers willing to share their, their, their data is um, right off the bat is one in four. Um, so we, we to summarise all of that and sort of take you through the story, I think... Um, understatement of the century, consumers are understandably uncertain about the future. Um, that uncertainty about the future is changing the way that they think about saving, the way they think about spending, and it's also changing what they want from a financial services organisation. Um, and to me, that gives you an opportunity to service that un unmet need. Consumers want help with their finances to a degree that they've never wanted it before. And if you're a traditional player, then you've got trust on your side, um, which is you know very, very, very significant. It's, it's the, the cornerstone of the relationship with the consumer. If you're a, a non-banking, non-traditional fintech provider coming into the market, um, you know there are um, plenty of examples there, and I gave a few in the Bano Paleta space where customer service, um, you know, at, at an exceptional level is going to lead to a builder build up of trust and an environment where customers are more um, open to taking more products through you um, and to, to um, in having a more deeply entrenched relationship. And I think, you know, as the New Zealand market looks forward and we look forward to open banking as a regime, um, there are opportunities on both sides of the coin um, from a non-banking perspective and a banking perspective. Uh, and I guess the only question um, is what you plan to do with it. Thank you.